the office of mission. Did anyone have any thoughts about our reading or about the position of the bishop or about ambiguity? Well, pre-Vatican II, it seems that all the bishops had a, a, a position of managing their own diocese and and make independent decisions with it about it or for it. Before Vatican II, yeah, uh, no, it, it wasn't. I mean, what were they talking about when they talk about the bishops in Germany who saying they didn't need? I thought it said they didn't need the the decision they, of the they Pope to tell them what to do. They didn't say they didn't need. They they. No, I know they didn't say they didn't need. I that was too generalized. I generalized it too much, but uh -huh. it seems like they could make own decisions in teaching and things. Um, because they were guided by Christ. I, I think that that's going sort of much too far and taking its context. I actually had looked for for that document. But I only found so the our book refers to an excerpt from it that was published in, in a collection of documents. And so that's the only thing I could only find that excerpt, but not the whole document. So I, I, I couldn't, you know, read the whole thing. But the but but I think we have to place it in its context. And and in fact that context is important because in some sense i think it defines the pre-vatican II view of the papacy mm. uh, but the context you know, is that bismarck had you know, so lutheranism is the state religion of germany it was and it still is in fact um and so Catholicism is, is a minority religion. It's a majority religion in some areas, but in Germany as a whole, it's a minority religion. And you know, there, there was a history, particularly in this period, of, of the rise of the United Germany under Prussia, of, um, of hostility between Lutherans and Catholics and between the Prussian state and Catholics. And so Bismarck had you know sort of announced that uh, the German bishops were were basically puppets, mm -hmm. that they were mere, you know, sort of overseers who uh, overseers is the wrong word. But they were mere um, managers who took the, their orders directly from the Pope. And so they responded to that um, by saying that their authority came from the same divine institution as that the papacy rests. Um, and Episcopal jurisdiction has not been absorbed into the papacy. The Pope hasn't taken the place of each individual bishop. Uh, the bishops are not merely tools of the Pope without responsibility of their own. And so that's basically all it says. It doesn't you know, claim to under. Yeah. But but the problem is um reading the um uh, uh pastor eternus the, the decree on uh the Vatican one decree on on the papacy and that doesn't address the issue of bishops. It uh, 
let's see if I can find them. It makes some relatively strong statements. On the one hand, it says that the power of the Pope is not only compatible with the authority of bishops, but it allows the authority of bishops to fly. <laughs> It says, but so far as this power of the Supreme Pontiff <laughs> from being any prejudice to the ordinary and immediate power of Episcopal jurisdiction by which bishops who have been set by the Holy Spirit to succeed and hold the place of the apostles, feed and govern each his own flock as true pastors, that this, their Episcopal authority is really assertive, strengthened, and protected by the supreme and universal pastor. In accordance with the words of St. Gregory the Great, my honor is the honor of the whole church. My honor is the firm strength of my brethren. I am truly honored when the honor due to each and all is not withheld. Um, so that's in some ways an interesting argument and, and sort of interesting to quote Pope St. Gregory the Great, since um, I don't know if anyone sort of knows this, but Pope St. Gregory the Great had absolutely no desire to be Pope. He um, preferred a life of monastic solitude. And he simply became Pope because he really was the um probably the only person with the kind of vision and you know sort of the sort of hope of the future for the future um that could have held western europe together in a moment of crisis much of our modern world is really built on the foundations laid by Pope St. Gregory the Great, uh, and above all, the university system, which is really unchanged since the Middle Ages, arose and developed and, and uh, flourished uh, based on um, the reforms of Saint Pope St. Gregory. In ways that we don't recognize, he really was the architect of the modern world. And he did it all reluctantly, not wanting to do any of that, and under duress. It was all an enormous sacrifice for him because he felt simply called by God to be responsible to do it, even though it was patently against his will. But so that's the argument that everything will sort of flourish precisely because of the power of the papacy. Um, I see that the last paragraph of the chapter sums it up pretty well in that the principal concern of the council was to write, arrive at a better balance in the understanding of the role of the bishops of the world in relationship to the ministry of the Bishop of Rome, meaning the Pope, uh -huh. in light of the lopsided teaching of Vatican I, the first Vatican Council, which right. put so much of the supremacy on the Pope and took um, responsibility or authority, actually, from the bishops. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pastor Eternus also says that the judgment of the Pope overrules that of an ecumenical council, and that an ecumenical council is not a higher authority than the Pope. That's a fairly striking statement that you know, is really contradicted by the history of much of the church. Is that what Vatican I said? That's, yeah, that's the, uh, 
That's the Vatican I first dogmatic constitution. Right, not Vatican II. Okay. Oscar returns. The question so, I the question I have some confusion about, um, and I guess I should try to go back and read the article that um is it what is it RP N or NRP? the National Register Press or something. Anyway, yeah. the Catholic and paper that seems to blow both conservative and non-conservative. It was talking recently about the um, individual or the head of a commission that Pope Francis has delegated, appointed, um to oversee the triton what, what do you call it ron the trinitarian Tridentine. latin mass and how Tridentine. They, Tridentine mass Tridentine. so yeah. they're saying now that those will not be performed within parishes they will need to be performed outside of a parish facility and um there was something in the article about a bishop in michigan that was having to deal with this and so i found it interesting because um in here it talks it gives bishops quite a bit of autonomy from vatican ii um and um so i was a little confused about although it does say too that bishops when they are appointed are agreeing to be in agreement and step with the pope and so i guess if there are some bishops who are allowing these latin masses which are um against what the ecumenical assembly of world bishops had decided that they wanted the vernacular rather than english so if there are some bishops that are going against that then they're not you hear what i'm saying yeah well the, the problem the problem is that although mass can be celebrated in the vernacular, the standard for the mass is, uh, I think it's called Novo Ordo, the New Order Latin Mass. So the standard, the gold standard of the mass, if you will, remains in Latin. It's just a new version of the Latin mass. And that's supposed to be the mass that we celebrate. You know, so those things like uh, the Lord be with you and also with you changed to with your spirit. That's because it was mistranslated from the Latin, from the New Order Latin Mass. And similarly, the confidior in the form that we are observing it now was also in the New Order Latin Mass. It was simply uh, not properly transported into the English language version, or at least the U.S. version. Um, and then, similarly, I think that's also true of consubstantial in the tree in, uh, in the creed. Although there, I'm not sure. I am sure, though, that consubstantial is a better rendering of, of the concept. But so the Latin Mass. It's a gold standard. It's just that the Tridentine Mass is not the gold standard. The Tridentine Mass is you know, the traditional pre Vatican II Latin Mass that started around the time of the Council of Trent in the 17th century. I think it's the 17th century. And um, and so, you know, I mean, we went through the rubrics of the mass 
of the Trident team mass. Um, you know, when, when in one of the classes where we discussed the liturgy, and it's problematic in many, many areas. No epiclesis, no prayers of the faithful, an optional homily. Um, you know, you can argue, and I would actually argue that the consecration is invalid, that there is no body and blood of Christ. It's bread and wine. I don't think you can have a, cons a consecration without an epiclesis. And that's a very traditional part of Mass. But in any case, the ability to do the um, Tridentine Mass was uh, supported by Pope John Paul II and extended by Pope Benedict in the hope that that would you know, lessen dissent. And then Pope Francis severely curtailed that, given that he felt that the Tridentine Mass was being really used as a front to attack changes in the church and to cause disun you know, disunity and discord within the church. So the Tridentine Mass was really being weaponized. Uh, so, so I guess one of the interesting things in all of this is that um, when people tend to be upset with the church, they always tend to blame the Pope. And uh, then that's a major area of going overboard. You know, I mean, there are the, the uh, I mean, the two major heresies and the three major heresies, um, and I don't remember what they're called, there's the um, Isn't one of them the Arian? It mentioned, oh, I think in the next chapter it talks about that. I I got going on because there was a segue about the next chapter. I got going on the next one and it mentions the Arian and may not be Arianism where they um, deny the the divinity of Christ, if I'm remembering correctly, but I don't remember what the other ones. Oh, one of them Ari is one Arianism of them is about is, the is evil an, of humans. Arianism is, is you know, sort of an old heresy that keeps popping up. Uh, but I was thinking particularly of heresies in regard to the Pope. So there are there are there are conclusions who um, I think they believe that the papacy is unoccupied because there hasn't been a valid papal election. There are seat of the Cantists who have elected an alternate pope. And then there's one other group led by a French priest, and I don't remember what they're called. So they generally take uh, the the decline or the, the absence of a valid pope or a corrupt pope or whatever, starting with Pope uh, Saint Pope John the Twenty Third, and then they continue it forward to to, uh, to Pope Paul to. Pope John Paul I, Pope John Paul II, to Pope Benedict, and then to Pope Francis. But an interesting thing in that is that it kind of assumes the church should be monolithic and that the Pope does have absolute authority 
It's just that, you know, you sort of have some guy who's misusing it or is invalidly elected or doesn't do a good job or doesn't do the job you want or, you know, whatever. It brought to mind um, Archbishop Hunthausen and uh -huh. his, um, the years of his ministry here in Washington, Western Washington mm -hmm. and what um, precipitated his retirement. Um, there's a book called Still and Quiet Conscience yeah. about his time in office as Archbishop. And it's a wonderful book. It's not very long. Um, if any of you have an interest in reading that, I'd recommend it. Um, because it this chapter talks about the role of the bishop is to guide his diocese in the teachings of Christ. Um, not only overseeing the sacraments and the education that is going on within the church, um, but also the masses and and being sure that the faithful have access to the sacraments. Um, so it, it was, I felt living through that, that he was fulfilling all of those um, goals for an archbishop. And, um, but he was also pushing the envelope because of his um, stand against nuclear arms and um, and that brought Reagan into it, which put pressure on Pope John Paul II. Um, it's just interesting to read this chapter and then think about what transpired for Archbishop Hunthausen. Mm -hmm. There are several things to think about here. I mean, so in the end, so Vatican, then the pre Vatican II period and, and the Vatican I <laughs> position on the papacy clearly went too far in making the Pope kind of a dictator. I think you could describe the Pope as a benevolent dictator. You know, that's sort of, uh, I think, would be an accurate uh, characterization of Pastor Eternus. But in the Vatican II and post Vatican II period, I mean, the church is always going to be hierarchical and that's been you know an enormous source of its strength uh, and and also you know in some sense if you look at it all of the church is very hierarchical it's a very narrow hierarchy right i mean father blue is our pastor the Archbishop Paul is the Archbishop. Somewhere in there is the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. And then there's the Pope. So, you know, we're three, two or three levels, three or four levels removed from the top of the hierarchy. So it's a very flat hierarchy. You know, the church is very hierarchical. We also, you know, in sort of thinking about this, also have to remember that Catholicism has, that if we look at, you know, Protestant denominations, and there are, I don't know how many of them there, there are, 
uh, there are tons, and you now they're in some sense all different. Within the Catholic Church, there are in many ways. I wouldn't. In some ways, you can argue that there's even greater diversity in the Catholic Church than there are among Protestant denominations. You know, I, I wouldn't want to go too far with that because there's also a basic disagreement, uh, basic agreement. But, you know, like in, the, in, in Protestantism, you see stupid, stupid schisms. You know, schisms, I mean, one of my favorites was you know, there are two groups and that they were sects. There were groups of, there was a group that split from the assembly of God. And then they in turn split over the issue of whether it was permissible to raise your hands in worship or whether it wasn't. Schism. Who cares? Non consequential. But many Protestant schisms are like that. They're totally non consequential. In, 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 in Catholicism, they would be described as adiaphora. Adiaphora is a Greek word that means something of no consequence. And so in the history of the church, it's generally been you know, sort of felt that adiaphora are not things worth arguing about. So and we, we have to you know, recognize that there's a, a diversity within Catholicism. You know, so each of the major orders is in some sense different from each of the other orders. That's why they exist. Um, and Within Catholicism, there's always been room for that diversity. The, the, the problem becomes, I mean, there are several problems here, and, and I don't know that there's you know, particularly easy solutions to them, but when does a particular movement or whatever uh, go out of bounds? So, Archbishop Hunthausen, did he go out of bounds? I mean, you know, there are uh, divided opinions about that. Liberation theology, particularly in South and Central America, did it go out of bounds? It sort of went underground, and, you know, but the spirit of liberation theology is still very much alive and well in South and Central America, and in many ways is reflected in, in Pope Francis. Um, but these are difficult issues is, you know, I mean, the Vatican two position on the one hand is that the Pope has power, is the supreme leader. And yet at the other, uh, on the other hand, the bishops also derive their authority from the apostles and the bishops are, it's necessary for the bishops to adapt to local conditions to ensure that the message of Christ is fully brought to you know, people in their area. And uh, in, in the diocese for which they're responsible. And that, you know, creates for a great deal of diversity. The diversity you're talking about is that uh, the diversities in race? Diversities in race, diversities in uh, you know economics 
diversities in ethnic composition, diversities, you know, in level of poverty, diversities in who's oppressed, diversities um, in ecumenism and what is the shape of ecumenism. Uh, I, I don't know if you heard when Bishop Matthew was here, he was talking about collaboration with Muslims. Um, and you know, given the church in his diocese has a very close working relationship with Muslim churches. And so you know, they collaborate on you know, issues of aid to the poor on issues of education. So they collaborate, they work very, very closely you know, and have joint, have uh, shared organizations. So you know, it's very ecumenical. Uh, whereas there's intense conflict between Muslims and Christians. Um, so, I mean, you know, local conditions define a great deal. And there are always going to be, you know, sort of local, I mean, issues where, as Americans, we have, for better or for worse, a particular focus that, you know, kind of can be often characterized as a first world focus. And we have, you know, first world problems. <clears throat> Although we also have problems of you know, racism, of ethnocentrism. But, um, you know, there are a whole different set of problems in the third world and, and much more acute problems and, and often problems simply <clears throat> stark problems of survival. And so the church, you know, really ha has to reflect that uh, and, and should reflect it. If it, uh, if it fails to do that, it, it has really fallen short of, of the call of Christ. So, so, um, so it's important that bishops have a certain measure of autonomy. The problem, you know, comes with what is that measure of autonomy? How do you formalize it? And, um, and especially, I mean, you know, the tendency is to reflect, to reflect things in canon law. And, and canon law tends to be, you know, sort of, a, <clears throat> well, legal, not in a good sense. And yet they are supposed to, according to this document, um, they are called to reflect the gospel and facilitate the teaching of Christ's way. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, the problem is what does that mean? And you know, particularly for the church in the United States and Western Europe and the problem of uh, declining church attendance, declining membership, um, decline of faith. And so the question is, you know, what do you, what do you, what, what is the root cause of that? And what do you do about it? And so, I mean, in some sense, that's you know the real source of of conflict that we see, at least in the, the church in the United States and, and in Western Europe today. 
Do you know, Ron, what the strife is between the recent strife between the German bishops and the Vatican is? I've um, only heard snippets of it and I, I don't know what it's about. Completely unrelated, there, there was a certain amount of strife with Pope Francis replacing a German bishop who was had used his episcopate to enrich himself in a major way. Um, but that's not what this is. There, there was something about the bishops in Rome had a synod, and there was something that came out of that that was causing some strife either with Pope Francis or with the more conservative members of the magisterium in the Vatican. And, and I, I don't know what it is. It, it came out of their synod, as I remember. In response to the sex abuse crisis, evidently, German bishops were in favor of blessing the same sex marriage for married priests and the ordination of women as deacons. And also for canon law to be re resolved, revised so that gay employees don't face firing. So that's, you know, a volatile issue and, you know, divisive, an issue that is device and where you know most broadly in responding to you know the, the crisis of the church in the west do we stay the same do we you know resort to the church's traditions which is to say, go backward. And if we go backward, what are the traditions that we go backward to? Or we to, do we go forward somewhere? And where is that forward? And how can we justify how much of going forward is sort of theologically and biblically justifiable? So, you know, I mean, those are all all difficult issues. I mean, it's easy, like I did last week, to you know express one's opinion about them, but you know to do so in a way that's constructive and and. Uh, you know, based on something other than opinion and supposition is, is very, very difficult. And in fact, many of the participants in, in the debate don't do a very good job of it either. And in many ways, the partners in the gospel is a good example you know, of the flexibility that bishops need to have. Archbishop H and has decided that we uh, we can't continue to do what we've done and expect a different result. So we have to move forward, and you know, we have to adjust accordingly, even though the process might be painful, and some might not like it, or perhaps. No one will like it, but that doesn't mean, you know, that can't be done. And also, I mean, in a lot of ways, I think, you know, the important thing to, you know, take out of Vatican II is, you know, a message of hope. You know, if we, I mean, on the surface, you know, in 
1964 when when Pope John the 23rd uh, became Pope, the church looked you know very solid. It looked like the church was growing. It looked like you know the church was prosperous. And yet, you know, underneath the surface, it really wasn't. Underneath the surface, you know, faith was, for many Catholics, very shallow. Formation was absent. Nothing was expected other than attending Mass. The priest, at least in some parishes, was a, or at least in my parish, and I assume that in others, was a petty despot. The very absence of someone imitating Christ. And so Vatican II was really necessary. And in many ways changed course in a way that was refreshing and hopeful. And at the same time, you know, in many ways, you know, the, the legacy of the pre-Vatican church, you know, sort of continues to live on. So I think there's a basic way in which we almost all see the, the Pope as an absolute authority with, you know, kind of an ironclad top-down structure. And that's, you know, actually not the way it works. But I think, you know, we've sort of all, uh, or at least I know for myself, you know, that, that kind of has been the way in which it's programmed into my head, even though I know that it's not accurate programming if that makes any sense. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, the point of all of this is that although, and I'm probably one of the last people who, you know, kind of follows my own whatever, but, while we all have opinions, we also should understand that these are difficult issues and that, you know, the opinions of other people, however, you know, off or silly, wrong or stupid, they may seem to us, in fact, you know, need to be heard and need to be considered because these are very, very difficult issues and there are no easy answers. How do you how do you support the power of the Pope in a hierarchical organization while allowing flexibility to bishops? What behavior is you know, appropriate for a bishop or a priest. And I mean, I'm not talking here about you know, sort of sexual abuse, but I'm talking about, you know, things like Archbishop Humphousen not paying taxes or, you know, Father Berrigan pouring blood on a nuclear submarine in a protest. Daniel Berrigan, well, actually, was his brother as well, who left the priesthood. Yeah, right. I remember that. Yeah. Or at the other extreme, you know, complaining that. Pope Francis is not papal and that we really need 
a pope who is papal and you know conveys the image of the papacy like Putin. Oh, mercy. Which was a uh, 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 comment in the Italian Catholic press when, when, uh, when Putin visited with the Pope, with Pope Francis. Yeah, so I mean, these are just difficult questions, difficult issues. And particularly difficult at this point in the, at least in the history of, well, I mean, there are difficult questions for the church as, as a whole. And they're equally difficult in, 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 say, South America. I think that the people who question Pope Francis's um, way of doing things and his stands on issues are the same people that don't want to recognize Vatican II. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, been my experience with the people that I know who are very conservative Catholics and would not be unhappy with going backwards to Vatican II. I mean, to Vatican I, the way okay. the mass was done. And three Vatican II. Yes. I mean, that's part so true that um, some of it is a response to Vatican II and you know, feeling that portions of Vatican II have gone too far. You know, I mean, so Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict both were, you know, sort of in conservative wings of Vatican II and you know, opposed the more liberal wings of Vatican II. Then the, the what also has been you know, dynamic is that um, in the period since Vatican II, Western culture has changed dramatically. And, and you know, when we look at it, um, you know, in a 50 year period, there have been changes that, you know, one would expect otherwise might take centuries or a millennia or something, you know, so, um, you know, 50 years ago was it conceivable that, um, well, it's now more than 50, but um, still 60 years ago, was it conceivable that gay marriage would be legalized or acceptable. I mean, 60 years ago, almost all gays were in the closet. 60 years ago, segregation existed in America. 60 years ago, America was um, a very imperialist power that dominated the world fairly brutally and ruthlessly, supporting really vicious dictators in much of the world. Sixty years ago, Communism existed, although you know some say that communists and socialists are you know all over the place. 
they can only say that because they don't know what communists and socialists are because there aren't any the, you know, I mean, arguably perhaps in Vietnam, the communists, uh, the Chinese claim to be communists, but they're not. And so that's all gone. Um, we've had you know, enormous the sex scandals in the Catholic Church and the other scandals, the, the death of all of the Native Americans and Canadian Catholic and, and other parochial schools and the supposition that the same thing may have happened in the United States. The Ireland was you know, the most Catholic country in the world. It's now one of the most secular societies in the world. Catholicism is just largely confined to old people. When they die, the church may well be gone. So enormous, enormous changes in, in 60 years. And so I, I think in many ways that, you know, the focus then becomes sort of the culture wars. You know, how do we respond to modern culture? And I think, you know, that's some, uh, you know, is in many ways the focus of struggle. So, you know, for particularly the, uh, those who want to revert, roll back the Vatican II reforms, the problem is that it exposed the church to the influences of modern culture. And we need to go back to you know, a, a more traditional version of the church where it was less, more immune to the influences of modern culture. And for the, you know, sort of the other extreme way, it's that, you know, we should embrace modern culture. It's where humanity is going and the church is not going to roll it back. And, you know, so those, positions are on the one hand you know diametrically opposed but they're also it's also you know important that we see that this raises the real issue I mean how do we respond to modern culture and really you know we should need to kind of look at that very very um very directly and, and think about it very very carefully so how do you remain separated separate and apart from culture while participating in it and hopefully transforming it. I didn't think we could remain separate. Good, Derek. I, well, I, do you think Jesus remains separate? Well, I, I'm using remain separate in the sense of not participate in its sinfulness. I mean, we, we have to remain separate in that sense that we, you know, don't, yeah. don't, uh, you don't know, engage. <laughs> don't, <laughs> if, if you get invited to, to yeah. an orgy held by your neighbor, you don't want to go. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> that, that's what I mean. But I no, was just thinking, um, 
trying to get things not consolidated maybe it's the wrong word but getting the church and and community together isn't that something we just did um about two months ago that synod thing that we did that um you you the, the listening sessions and the, the listening sessions right you see what people were missing from the, yeah belonging although, to the community yeah. wasn't that something well, that it, it was there was a little bit of community outreach but it was mostly you know from within members of the parish uh at least at least for us as catholics we often tend to be insular and so i mean it's really struck me that many catholics don't know a great deal about other faith traditions for example um you know so we identify as catholic things that are common to all of the pre-reformation churches because we don't know anything about the traditions of the other pre-reformation churches even though we agree with them in you know 95 to you know 98 percent of everything we don't know a great deal about protestant traditions uh, and some catholics think that they're basically the same as catholic traditions or catholic practice um so there's a certain insularity at least for our, our parish you know, the major kind of outreach is with you know through saint vincent de paul well and the just faith ministry is i i don't know if saint john vianney um had a just faith program or not but i went through it about 12 years ago and it's a ministry that i think is alive and well in our diocese as well as in the country um mm -hmm. and it is calling us to reach out to be that leaven in the world where we bring peace and justice in our daily lives and some of us are called to reach out beyond that margin to stand and walk with people who are on the margins and who are underprivileged and who are prejudiced who are experiencing prejudice against them uh -huh. And I think that's how we're called to be in the world. And I think Derek, you were alluding to that when you said, are we called to be in the world or separate from the world? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't implying that we should be separate from the world. I was really saying that, well, I, you know, Paul tells us to not be conformed to the world. And so the question is, you know, how do you do that? You, uh, I don't believe you can withdraw from the world. I don't believe you can separate from yourself from the world. And yet, you know, in the midst of participating in, in the midst of being in the world, you have to remain holy. Mm you have to in some form be set apart jesus did that perfectly right he engaged in you know all sorts of activities that you know were simply from the viewpoint of the pharisees unacceptable eating with people who you know tax collectors sinners uh contact with gentiles who were seen as defiling so he did that and yet he you know remained holy right how he did that and remained holy you know is is 
I mean, that's not necessarily easy. I mean, and, you know, it sort of raises the question of what kind of things, you know, cross the line. I don't think that you know, that's necessarily an easy answer. You know, but I think that, I mean, I, well, I mean, I think I've made it, you know, I think everyone knows that my position is that we can't go back. We, we have to go forward, but we have to participate in modern culture. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not different than, you know, in the history of the early church, the constant issue that arose when evangelizing among pagans, and especially once evangelization began to happen among, you know, so-called barbarian peoples. I mean, you know, their cultures are very different. They're non-Christian. They worship in a variety of ways that are strange. And, you know, evangelists always approach them with you know, the viewpoint of how do we make a transition for them? What in their culture is worthwhile, godly? Because in some sense, given that God has created all things and all things created all things good, some part of what they do reflects God. So how do you separate them? How do you build on the good things? How do you bring them forward? And, and that was a real source of strength in the early, in the early church. I mean, it was, I mean, it's what resulted in particularly you know, the Christianization of, of Western Europe. And that's how it happened. We you know, had St. Irenaeus going from, uh, where was he from? He was from Smyrna to Gaul and preaching to barbarians, evidently in their native language. And he wrote about the strength of their faith in comparison to you know, more long-time Christians. They could always be counted on to defend the gospel. And so, yeah, so, I mean, going back simply, well, you know, doesn't work and is not, I don't think, I mean, is what we're called to do. And when he comes down from the Sermon on the Mount, the first thing that Jesus does is heals a leper. The leper comes to him and Jesus touches him and heals him. So remember, lepers are supposed to wear a sign that says unclean. They're supposed to wander around yelling unclean so everybody can get out of the way. According to the Mishnah, which is you know, a second century document, but parts of it reflect Pharisaic practice. If the shadow of a leper touches you, you're unclean. So this leper is violating major taboo. You know, Jesus should flee in terror. Touching a leper renders you unclean. And Jesus touches him, a major violation of the purity laws. And, and so the message that, that, that conveys is that when the holy 
touches the unholy. And when the clean touches the unclean, the unholy becomes holy and the unclean becomes clean. When, you know, just going back means that when the unclean touches the clean, the clean becomes unclean. When the unholy touches the holy, the holy becomes unholy. But that's the opposite of Jesus' message. So, I mean, for that reason, I think going back, reverting to a past state that in many ways you know, has brought us to this state. So it's not going to, it's you know, an extreme example of doing the same thing. It's not going to help us as people of faith. Uh, so next week we'll do uh, mm -hmm. Episcopal Collegiality, which is a continuation of the role of the bishop. And in um, the and in light of the work or the the call of Pope Francis for a synodal process, I think it's really timely, don't you, Ron? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm eager yeah. to find what comes out of the meetings of the bishops in the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I am. I am too. Uh, 